We're back with another Science in Pajamas, but a wellness edition, where I'm going to read to you three short stories from The Greatest Stories Never Told. So these are short recountings of certain things in history and some things that aren't necessarily commonly taught in history classes, but are still true stories. First one takes place in the year 452. It's called Waterworld. The barbarians we have to thank for the birth of a legendary city. Rape and pillage, houses torched, crops stolen, and hasty graves for bloody corpses. This was the legacy of Attila's Huns, sweeping across northern Italy and wreaking havoc and destruction on the remnants of the Roman Empire. But they unintentionally left another more positive legacy as well. Refugees fled from burning cities, desperate to find safe refuge. Some literally took to the swamps, finding sanctuary in a desolate group of islands in a marshy lagoon off the northern Adriatic. When the Huns were followed by other invading tribes, more Roman citizens streamed into, into the swamps to avoid the carnage and destructions on the mainland. Over the next few centuries, they transformed the inhospitable surroundings into an architectural wonder. Venice. With more than 400 bridges and almost 200 canals, it became a center of trade and a seafaring power. Though out of misfortune, Venice eventually turned into one of the richest and most beautiful cities in the world. Harsh necessity can be the mother of glorious invention. <clears throat> then it's got a couple nice little pictures there. And the captions for those read, yes, hi. The city of Venice was built on 118 islands two and a half miles from the mainland. Its streets are a precarious few inches above sea level and are currently sinking at a frightening level, about one inch every 10 years. Efforts are underway to protect the city from being overcome by the ocean. We live like sea burns, a quote from Roman statesman Cassiodorus in a letter to Venetians, circa 537. The gondolas that dot the waterways of Venice have been around for at least a thousand years, with the first known mention of them coming in the year 1094. <clears throat> they evolved over the centuries, and it wasn't until the 1700s that they finally assumed the familiar form today. These gondoliers were photographed in 1869. So that's the picture at the bottom there. Yes, Ripley wants to be a star of this story time, apparently. All right. So since we already mentioned Attila the Hun, let's go to the next one, the death of Attila. This takes place in the year 453. A warrior poised to conquer the world until marriage proved his undoing. Attila the Hun. Even today, the name conjures up villages of pillage and destruction. King of the Huns for 20 years, he commanded an army of half a million men, made all of Europe tremble, and threatened to capture Rome itself. But the terrifying Attila died before he completed his conquests of the civilized world, and it wasn't on the battlefield. It was on his wedding night. In the year 453, Attila took a new wife, a young girl named Odico. Pronouncing that correctly. Renowned for her beauty, after a night of drunken revelry in celebration of the wedding, he retired with his bride to the bedchamber, where he promptly passed out on his back. The following day, servants became alarmed when Attila didn't rise at the normal time. After their shouts failed to wake him, they knocked down the door. Inside, they found the body of their chieftain sprawled out on the bed besides his weeping bride. Was he the victim of murder at the hands of his new wife? Not at all. It seems that for all his power and might, the great conqueror had a weakness. He suffered from chronic nosebleeds. Shh, Ripley. One apparently came upon him in his drunken state, and he choked to death. So it was that one of history's most fearsome warriors died not from a bloody wound, but from a bloody nose. The Scourge of God, the name given to a hill... Attila by frightened Romans. Shortly before he died, Attila was bearing down on Rome with a great army, but Pope Leo I came out to meet with Attila and convinced him to turn away. 
People thought it was a miracle, but actually Attila was low on supplies. Two years after Attila's death, another barbarian tribe sacked the city. It was an event so frightening that it burned the name of the attackers into our vocabulary. They were called the Bandos. At Attila's funeral, his body was laid out in a silk tent and horsemen rode in circles around it. Many of his followers gashed their faces so that they would weep blood at his death. His burial party was murdered so that his grave might never be found. So that was the picture on the other page. <clears throat> the Children's Crusade. So a lot of us have probably heard of the Crusades in Europe in the early part of the century. But let's talk, not century, I'm sorry, of the millennia. So let's talk a little bit about one particular one called the Children's Crusade. It occurred in the year 1212. The tragic crusade that gave birth to a legendary story. <clears throat> in 1212, a French shepherd boy named Stephen of Cloyes had a vision. The intense blue-eyed youth told everyone that Jesus had called on him to raise an army of children to win back the Holy Land. He began preaching to crowds of people. His appeal struck a chord among devout Christians ashamed of the atrocities of earlier crusades. Perhaps the pure of heart could succeed where the corrupt armies that had gone before had failed. Tens of thousands of children were enlisted in the Children's Crusade. Across France and Germany, village after village was emptied of its young people. Some were orphans, but many were sent by parents who believed they were doing God's will. The children marched off in high spirits, chanting hymns, confident of victory. But they would never see Jerusalem, and only a handful ever made it back. Thousands of German children died of hunger and exposure during an agonizing march across the Alps. Fate had even worse things in store for the French children. More than a thousand, including Stephen, Stephen perished when their ships sank crossing the stormy Mediterranean. Several thousand survived the journey only to be sold into slavery by the merchants who had transported them. This tragedy inspire, inspired a folktale that lives to this day, born of collective guilt and the need for someone to blame. A dark story of a town whose happy children were spirited away forever by the Pied Piper. So then we have, just like before, a picture with some captions and a quote. So a 13th century German writer said, Many thought all this was happening not because of foolishness, but because God had inspired them. Stephen's vision inspired a 12-year-old German boy from Cologne named Nicholas. Encouraged by his father, Nicholas recruited German ch children for the crusade and led them across the Alps. When parents in Cologne eventually learned the fate of their children, they dragged Nicholas's father out of his house and hanged him. Stephen believed that when his army of children reached the Mediterranean Sea, the seas would part for them. Puzzled when that failed to happen, they were delighted when two merchants offered to ferry them across. The merchants, however, Hugh the Iron and William the Pig, betrayed the children, taking them to Egypt instead of Palestine and selling them to slave traders. All right, we got one more today. Count Vlad. <clears throat> so this is 1459, the murderous prince who will live in legend forever. In the 1450s, there lived a prince known as Vlad the Impaler. He was ruler of Wallachia, a small principality in what is now Romania. Much of what we know about Vlad comes from his enemies, and it paints a rather dark picture. He ruled with an iron hand and had no mercy for those who disobeyed him. He impaled people by the thousands and sometimes washed down his meals with their blood. Stories of his cruelty abound. He is said to have skinned unfaithful lovers alive. When two visiting ambassadors refused to remove their hats, saying it was not the custom in their country, Vlad replied with grim humor that he would like to support their customs and he ordered the hats nailed to their heads. A charming fellow, Prince Vlad. After his death in 1476, people tried hard to forget him, but the scary stories of his short time in power never really went away. 
In the 1890s, Vlad achieved a special sort of immortality when a writer doing research at the British Museum came across an old manuscript about him. Its tale of unvarnished evil inspired Bram Stoker to create one of the darkest characters of all time. Vlad's father was known as Dracul, which in Romanian means dragon or devil. Vlad was the son of the devil. Dracula. And then we have some pictures and some captions and all that, so I'll read those. The shocking story of a monster and berserker called Dracula. That's a title page from a 15th century account of Count Vlad. In 1459, an invading Turkish army came across a gruesome warning left by Vlad. The decaying bodies of perhaps 20,000 Turkish captives impaled on stakes. But Vlad also impaled his own subjects as punishment for almost any crime. One estimate says he may have personally authorized the killing of as many as 100,000 of the half million people in his principality. Although he was Prince of Wallachia, Vlad was actually born, appropriately enough, in nearby Transylvania. He spent more time as a prisoner of other rulers than he did on the throne. His longest stretch of rule lasted only six years. He was eventually killed in battle, trying unsuccessfully to retake his land from the Turks. So, you know, just a few little things from history. These are true stories from history. Just so you know, as bad as right now might seem, things could be a lot worse. So I hope you guys enjoyed that little story time. And until next time, take care. Bye-bye.